It's good to see everyone this morning. Hope everyone is doing well. Good to have Brother Bill Fairbanks with us today. Uh, we are going to be thinking in this morning's lesson, we're going to be thinking about Ezekiel. And you might go in, if you're not already turned over there, you might be turning to Ezekiel chapter 18. Uh, I don't know about, about you, but um, just tell you how I am, that in looking at the Old Testament, looking at the timeline of the Old Testament, you have all the various prophets. You have the major prophets and you have the minor prophets. And sometimes I just get confused about which prophet prophesied when, there were prophets who prophesied before captivity. There were those who prophesied during captivity. There were those who prophesied after captivity. Sometimes the books will give us an indication in the opening few verses about when they were prophesying. Not always, but usually. And so Ezekiel, we know when Ezekiel was prophesying based on the first chapter. He's actually prophesying in the middle of captivity. So this is Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year. So that's the 30th year of captivity. Captivity is 70 years. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And the, the word of the Lord is going to come to Ezekiel. Here they are in captivity. And so what you end up, ha ha what you end up having, if I could speak, all through Ezekiel is you have their different punishments as well as the reasons for their punishment that were happening. That, of course, there had been so much sin, and the sin had gotten worse and worse. There may have been moments of reprieve in the southern kingdom, but it was just not good until finally they're carried off into captivity. Eventually, though, even as you have all these things being portrayed, you get you run into chapter 18. And in chapter 18, there is, there is a saying that has gained popularity in Israel as they're in captivity. And this is the saying. This is Ezekiel 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb? Okay, this is not an inspired proverb. This is a saying they have. What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten sour, sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? Now, what were they saying with that? Their saying was, we are bearing the consequences for what those who came before us have done. Because they sinned, we are now in bondage. We are now in captivity. So what they're actually saying was, we are, we are being penalized for what someone else has done, right? The fathers have eaten, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So that's, that's where it begins. Basically, they were not accepting responsibility for their own actions, right? They thought that they were enduring these things because of what those who came before them had done. When in fact, they themselves had sinned. And so the Lord is clarifying these things through the mouth of Ezekiel. What we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at chapter 18. And we're going to think about how fair God is. Right. So their proverb is, we are, we are suffering because of what someone else has done. And the Lord wants them to understand, no, you're suffering because of what you've done. Now, there is an opportunity, and we'll talk about it more as we go along. But, but I want to look at the chapter and think about how fair God is. And that language is used later on in the chapter because they're basically saying that God is not fair. And that's just not true. God is fair. This lesson, as an application, we're going to be thinking about a few different denominational doctrines. We're going to think about two specifically. We're going to be thinking about inherited sin, and we're going to be thinking about predestination. But, you know, those, those doctrines and denominational doctrine in general sometimes tries to creep into the church. And when that happens the church starts, frankly, becoming denominational in their thinking. And some of those denominational doctrines are creeping into the church. So the third, <coughs> excuse me, 
the third doctrine we're going to be thinking about pertains to, in days gone by, you may have heard of continuous cleansing. You may have heard of the grace unity movement. You may have heard it described as other things, but it speaks to what we'll, what we'll talk about, the imputation of righteousness, the imputation of sin and the imputation of righteousness. So let, let's go ahead and, and look through Ezekiel chapter 18 and to look at the, the first handful of verses, verses 1 through 19, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but just notice verse 3. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains, and that's speaking about idolatry, if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, right? if he's not oppressed anyone, verse 8, if he has not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but withdrawn his hand from iniquity. Verse 9, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says the Lord. Now, if he begets a son who is a robber, verse 10, if that son is a shedder of blood, who does those things, if he does commit idolatry, if he oppresses the poor, verse 13, if he has exacted usury, or take an increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Verse 14, If, however, he begets a son, who sees all the sins which his father has done, and considers but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, if he's not oppressed anyone, if he has withdrawn his hand, um, if he has withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received usury or increase, and not done these things, if he's executed his judgments, all these things, if he has if he has executed my judgments, verse 17, and walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brothers by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Now verse 19. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. God is fair, and what God is saying is, you will not be held accountable for someone else's sins. That is not how God works. Now, we will be held accountable for our sins, but we are not going to be held accountable for someone else's sins. We know what denominations teach. I, I was with, on social media. If you start going down a denominational rabbit hole and you'll hear, you'll hear what the John MacArthur's say. Right? That's a big time denominational preacher. And they'll talk about these sorts of things that we inherit original sin, that we inherit sinful, a sinful nature, and all those things happen because of Adam and Eve's sin, that we inherit sin from them. We inherit a sinful nature from them. What God is trying to tell Israel is no. You are where you are because of your own sins. <laughs> yes, your fathers did sin. Yes, your grandfathers did sin. But you know, it's funny, for example, in the life of Manasseh. Manasseh was extremely wicked, extremely wicked. But you know what Manasseh does at the end of his life? He repents. He repents, and all of a sudden he comes back and he's doing good in Israel. Now his son, Amon, if I remember correctly, his son is wicked. His son is wicked. So it goes Manasseh, grandfather, Amon, son, and then Josiah. And Josiah is a good king. And so the, Lord's t the Lord tells Josiah, these things are going to come, but it's not going to be in your life because he had humbled himself and turned to God. 
And so it's the same thing that we see here. We are not held accountable. Now, there may be consequences, for example, when Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden. And the Lord says that part of it was lest they should take of the tree of life and live forever. So, yes, we do die physically because we have been removed from the tree of life. We do die physically because of that. So there are consequences. But as far as sin, no, this verse very clearly says, and other verses show, that God is fair. Yet you say, why should the Son not bear the guilt of the Father? Because the Son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. If, if we are separated from God, it is not anybody else's fault but ourselves, but our own fault. Romans 5 at verse 12, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, that's talking about spiritual death, I would suggest, and death through sin, remember what the Lord told Adam and Eve, the day you eat it, you shall die. That's not talking about physical death, that's talking about spiritual death. Just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, and people stop reading right there. <laughs> they don't read the last three words. Why does death spread to all men? Why does spiritual death spread to all men? It's not because of Adam and Eve. It's because all sinned. It says. It's because we sin. All have sinned. Look at where we are. We're in Romans 5 verse 12. We know what Romans 3 says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How do they fall short? How do we fall short? Because of someone else's sin? No, because of our sins. That's what separates us from the Lord. The fairness of God. We will not be held accountable for other people's sins. We do not inherit other people's sins. We do not inherit other people's sinful nature. If inherited sin, if original sin is true, then what ends up happening is you have to deal with two issues. One is Jesus. If we inherit sin, if we are born in sin, well then why was Jesus not born in sin? He was born. Why wasn't Jesus born in sin? Typically, if not universally, one false doctrine leads to another false doctrine. And so if you believe in original sin, it shouldn't be any surprise that that false doctrine leads to the other false doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception, started by Catholicism, does not pertain to Jesus' conception. It pertains to Mary's conception. That when Mary was conceived, that's when original sin was not passed down. So therefore, when Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit, that's why Jesus did not inherit sin. Please show me where any of that is in the Bible. And you're not going to find it. No. No. Mary did not remain a virgin. And Mary was not sinless. She speaks of her Savior as well. Mary needed saving as well. Bottom line is, you don't inherit sin. You don't inherit sin because God is, God is not unfair. God is fair. Ezekiel, what he's saying is, I'm not going to hold you accountable for someone else's sins. No. <laughs> if a father does, his, does what is right, he will be accepted. If he does what is wrong, he will be rejected. If his son turns from his errors... And if the son does what is right, he's not going to inherit his father's sin. No, that's not how this works. Behold, all souls are mine, verse 4. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is just, he shall live. The other issue, if folks believe in, in this sort of thing, if folks believe in original sin, you're going to have to deal with babies. What happens if a baby, and this is, this is why, by the way, this is why certain denominations practice infant baptism. Why do they feel the need to practice infant baptism? It's because they believe babies are born in sin. Okay, well then what happens 
if a baby is stillborn? Does life begin at birth? Or does life begin at conception? They don't, they don't like those sorts of questions, but you can, you can look at their doctrine. And this, this issue, by the way, was spoken about in this past week's podcast. And Daniel Sanders, who I do the podcast with, he had several quotations from the Catholic literature itself. And they speak about how unborn babies and babies that are not baptized, a.k.a. sprinkled, how they are in danger. And this is one reason, if you have a Catholic cemetery, that babies who are not sprinkled or baptized, they are not allowed to be buried just anywhere in that cemetery. They have a special place, and by that I mean an unspecial place, because they believe babies are born in sin, and that's why they baptize babies. Show me where any of that is in Scripture where children are baptized for the remission of their sins. You're not going to find it. What you are going to find is Jesus, when the disciples are arguing about greatness, calling the little child, taking the child up in his arms, blessing little children, the Lord concerning the child. The Lord says, unless ye are converted and become like a little child, you will in no way enter the kingdom. The child is held up as an example of innocence, not as an example of depravity. The Lord... The Lord is fair. And the Lord is saying we will not be held accountable for someone else's sins. We will be held accountable for our own and our own only. God at judgment where the Lord renders to each one according to their deeds. Not the deeds of somebody else according to their deeds, what they've done. Well, I'll just say this. It makes you appreciate the fairness of God. If your parents were godless, God does not hold you accountable for that. If your grandparents were godless, God does not hold you accountable for that. If your spouse is godless, God does not hold you accountable for that. If all, as all of those things, as we think about it, it just makes you appreciate the fairness of God. That's what it, that's what it does. And so we have to accept responsibility, but we appreciate as we understand that God is fair. Now, we will not be held accountable for other people's sins. And then to read on in Ezekiel, verse 20, it says, The soul whose sins shall die, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. The wonderful thing is that people can change. People can repent. That concept that I would suggest we take for granted, the majority of the denominational world, they reject the possibility for change. Because they teach the Protestant view of predestination. They believe that before time began, God predetermined individually who was going to be saved, and He predetermined who was going to be lost, and those decisions, those predeterminations, were in no way based on what the people themselves did or were going to do. They were predestined for heaven or the masses for hell, and there's nothing that people can do about it. Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) That's a horrible view. That is an absolutely horrible and horrid view. It is almost as bad, if not as bad, as saying babies are born sinful. They're saying that people cannot change. They're saying that people cannot repent. Now, what they'll do is they'll backtrack and they'll say, oh, no, because they say, yeah, we repent, but we repent because the Lord made us repent. Right? The reason we have faith is because the Lord instilled faith in us against our will. He predetermined that we would have faith, and He gives faith miraculously. 
Well, if he gives faith miraculously to the minority, to those who go through the narrow gate, if he goes, if he miraculously gives faith to some, then why does he not miraculously give faith to all? Why would he predetermine before time began that the majority of his creation was going to be lost? That is a horrible doctrine. Why would he do that? When Scripture clearly says that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Verse 23 here in Ezekiel, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? People can change. People can repent. People have free will. People have free will. And it's that is a wonderful thing that we can change. Now, we can change the other way too, verse 24. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. Wait a minute, he was righteous though. He was righteous. And what did he do? He turned away from his righteousness and he committed sin. He committed iniquity. He's guilty. The sin which he committed, because of them he shall die. So people can change both ways. Sinners can repent, but the repentant can also become unfaithful. We can set our minds on things above, or we can set our minds on things beneath. What this speaks to is the doctrine of once saved, always saved. It's like, no, no, it it is not set in stone. At the point where it is set in stone is when we die. And you have the rich man and you have Lazarus. And there is a goal fixed in between them so that those who want to pass from one to the other cannot. Lazarus could not go to where the rich man was and the rich man could not go to where Lazarus was. That's when it's set in stone. But as far as on this earth and as long as we have breath in our body, people can change. Not everybody believes that, sadly, sadly. The whole Protestant view of predestination That is not fair. That is not fair. That God predetermines who is lost and there's nothing they can do about it. That is not fair and God is fair. God is fair. People can change and God knows it. The choice is theirs. Jesus is simply the way. People don't have to take the way. But he made the way. He's the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2. He made the way. What we cannot do is we cannot try to excuse sin. Right? That's what Israel was doing. They were trying to make excuses. That's what they were doing. Oh, well, our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. They're making excuses for their own sins. They're saying they're suffering because of what their parents had done and what those came before them did, and they're denying their own sins and making excuses for it. We cannot make excuses for sin. We do not get to say, oh, well, I was born this way. This is the problem as we think about applications. You ever known someone who, oh, uh, let me just speak for myself. Sometimes, Sometimes I can lose my temper. When I lose my temper, you know what I'm tempted to do? And I'm just like my dad. Sometimes dad would lose his temper. So because dad lost his temper, that so that excuses away me losing my temper? And I'm just like dad. No, nope, I got to I got to take responsibility. Well, you know, I was just that's how I that's just how I am. I was born this way. No you weren't. <laughs> No, you weren't. We, we, that's not how it is. Nope. We grew up. We were shaped. We were molded. And we have free will. 
and we can change. We can change. We can repent. It's like people saying, that the view of, of all these things, the view of Protestant predestination, I should say. If once saved, always saved is true. If pro, The Protestant view of predestination is true. It's like saying once a sinner, always a sinner. That's not true either. Right? Once saved, always saved is the same as saying once lost, always lost. That's not true either. That's not true. We can change. I always think about a passage in the Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is one of the givings of the Ten Commandments concerning the Sabbath. With, with the two accounts of the Ten Commandments, it's interesting that when it speaks to the Sabbath, it talks about two different reasons. In the other reading in Exodus, it talks about how in God's creation, on the seventh day, God rested. But in Deuteronomy's account, it mentions something else. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. What he's saying is, you were a slave. You're not a slave anymore. Stop saying you're a slave. You're not a slave. Right? That's the problem when we think about how sinful we are. If we are sinful, what do we need to do? Repent. If we repent and confess our trespasses, according to 1 John 1, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're not full of sin at that point. If we're forgiven, we're forgiven. The just shall live. This whole idea, we can repent. It speaks to the power of the great physician. The great physician does not leave us sick. Jesus came to save sinners, but Jesus did not come to leave sinners in sin. No, he calls us. He calls people to repent. And when we do, as we change, by God's grace, found in Jesus, we recognize the power that he has. God is fair. He's fair. People can change. And anyone who says differently, they need to explain all the passages in the Bible that talk about repentance. <laughs> because it literally is changing. And what, what has to be explained is, because God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, if God can force some people to repent, then why does God not force everyone to repent? And if God does not force everyone to repent, then what is the distinction between those who are saved and those who are lost? Is it God's fault or is it man's fault? And man's own free will. That's what Ezekiel 18 is all about, free will, the fairness of God. Here in Ezekiel, once again, verse 20, when it talks about righteousness, at the tail end of verse 20, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. God recognizes your righteousness. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Like I said, another popular false doctrine that gets bandied about sometimes and it's kind of a churchy phrase, but it concerns, it's called the imputation of righteousness. The imputation, all right? And this is basically what the wrong view of the imputation is. This is the wrong view. That Jesus' righteousness stands in place of our unrighteousness. I want you to think about that. Jesus' righteousness stands in place of our unrighteousness. Another way to put it is this, that when God looks on our sinfulness, He sees Jesus' righteousness. That when God looks down on man and He sees John and John sinning, if John's a Christian, He doesn't see John sinning, He just sees Jesus' righteousness. Well, if he looks down and he sees John sinning, 
and he just sees Jesus' righteousness, why doesn't that count for the whole world? <laughs> All sin and come short of the glory of God. So that's the wrong view of the imputation. To think about it, what Ezekiel says and what other passages show, we'll see in a moment, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. Here on the screen, if what is on the screen is true, then everybody would be saved. If Jesus' righteousness stands in the place of our unrighteousness, and if when God looks down on our sinfulness, he sees Jesus' righteousness, if that is true, then everybody's saved and you have universalism. Now, if universalism is not true, then what's on the screen cannot be true, I would suggest. All are not saved because all do not turn from their sins. In Romans chapter 4, the verse that speaks about this imputation, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> all right? I have not gone to college to study Hebrew. I went to college for something else. So I have not studied Hebrew. I have not studied Greek. I am not on one of the Bible translation boards, yada, yada, yada. Y'all know that. Y'all know how dumb I am, okay? If you don't, talk to me afterwards. I'll talk more about how dumb I am. But anyway, <laughs> but I don't understand why in Scripture, in the same passage, when you have the exact same word that is used, they translate it different ways. I don't know why they do that. I wish they would not do that. Just for example, those of you who've used King James in times past, use King James currently, I have no idea why in one verse it translates Passover as Easter. Just in one verse in the King James. You know how many times the word Passover shows up in, in Scripture? A lot. Yet in one verse they translated it as Easter. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why in this passage, I'll tell you right now, that word on the third line down that says accounted, that is the exact same word on the fifth line down for imputes. Why translate it as accounted in one place and imputes in another? Don't ask me. I have no idea. Regardless, just hang on to that because it'll help understand what the imputation does mean. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted, same word for imputation, is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes or accounts, uh, imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute or account sin. Different translations, all the different translations, New, New King James, King James, New American Standard, ESV. This word for impute, it's translated as accounted, counted, credited, reckoned. All of these things for righteousness. It is an accounting term. It literally means to take an inventory. It literally means when Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It's the same word. It was imputed to him for righteousness. What Do you think that, so did Abraham believe God or not? So what they think is that God gave Abraham faith miraculously, that that's how it was imputed. No, that's not what the word means. It means that God recognized it. He reckoned it. Abraham believed God on his own free will. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted as righteousness. Namely, God was pleased. God was pleased with what Abraham did. That's what it means. And this verse up on the screen, this imputation, what it's speaking about, the accounting for righteousness, when David describes it, David is simply saying, the man who is forgiven. The man who turns from his sins. David is saying the same thing that the Lord says through Ezekiel. The man who sins, the man who has sinned, who has sinned, 
When a righteous man, verse 24, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, that's one thing. But if the transgressors, if a wicked man, verse 21, if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps my statutes, does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The righteousness of the righteous. God reckons. God credits it. God accounts. God imputes, takes inventory. He sees it as righteousness, that the man is wanting to do what is right and is turning to him because he knows he needs God's forgiveness. This passage, pardon me, this, these ideas up on the screen, why this is important is because it is tempting to think, it is tempting to think that because of everything the Lord has done, and the Lord has done much. The Lord has done much. It's tempting to think we don't have to do anything. That's the problem. That's the temptation. Because the Lord has done everything He's done, it's tempting to think we don't have to do anything. And that's just simply not the case. That's just simply not the case. Another problem with what's up on the screen is the idea, because this is, this is the problem. If, when God looks on our sinfulness, He sees Jesus' righteousness, well, why not just continue to sin then? Why not just continue to sin? If when God looks down, He just sees Jesus' righteousness, why not just keep sinning? This, this problem, and pardon me if all that is over your head and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> this problem is creeping into the church. I would suggest this problem has always tried to creep into the church. This problem has always tried to creep into God's people. All right, 20 or 30 years ago, it was called the Grace Unity Movement. You know what the Grace Unity Movement is? It's, well, it's this up on the screen. It's, you know, big sins God has a problem with, but little sins, eh, God looks down and he just sees Jesus' righteousness. We can still have unity in the name of grace. People don't really have to repent. Before the grace unity movement, you know what it was called back in the 60s? It was called continuous cleansing. You know what continuous cleansing was? Well, people don't really have to repent. The Lord's blood just continuously washes over us. So when the Lord looks down, it's like a sinner holding an umbrella and the umbrella. And when God looks down, he just sees the umbrella and he just sees Jesus. You know what the problem with that is? What's under the umbrella? We're still in our sin. <laughs> it's like stop using metaphors and stop using figures that aren't in Scripture. Try reading the Bible. And when it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are we cleansed or not? Must we repent or not? So it's always been trying to creep into the church. Going all the way back to biblical times. In Romans, in Romans, what was it that the apostles were slanderously reported as to be saying? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? It's the same thing. Oh, well, we can continue to sin and the Lord just sees His Son's righteousness. No, that's not how this works. The soul who sins shall die. But if we turn from our wicked ways, if we turn to the Lord, He reckons righteousness. Going all the way back to the garden. All the way back to the garden. Garden and directly post-garden. What does the devil tell Eve? Eve says, He told us not to eat. If we eat, we'll die. And what's the devil say? You will not die. The devil was denying the wages of sin. In the New Testament, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Denies the wages of sin. Continuous cleansing denies the wages of sin because it says you don't really have to repent. The grace unity movement did the same thing and a false understanding of the imputation of these things. Also, 
It denies the wages of sin. God recognizes righteousness. That's what he does. That's what he does through Jesus. It all speaks to the power of Jesus. It all speaks to our need for repentance. That's what Ezekiel is all about. Israel was saying, we're bearing the consequences for someone else's actions. We have nothing to repent of. Oh, they most certainly did. (laughs) They most certainly did. That's what Ezekiel 18 is all about. Do you remember what the Lord tells Cain? Cain brings his offering. It is not accepted. And do you remember what God tells him? If you do well, will you not be accepted? That's what he says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Sin lies at the door, but you should master it. You must master it. Cain goes out and slays Abel. But the Lord tells him, if you do well, he says, you'll be accepted. Well, he was not doing well. God recognizes our righteousness. It's important. By grace, and that's we have to... We have to emphasize that by God's grace, by mercy, by grace and mercy found in Jesus. That in no way means we don't have to repent. No. The righteousness of the righteous, verse 20 of Ezekiel 18, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The difference is repentance just as the Romans passage spoke about. Here in Ezekiel, as we wrap things up, verse 24, talking about if the righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity. What a sad picture. A falling away, a sliding back, going back to perdition. All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. What a sad picture. Verse 25, yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. See, they're arguing with God. They're saying that God's not fair. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. Because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Man makes a hash of a lot of things. Israel was making a hash of a lot of things, but very simply, the Lord says, turn and live. You do not, in Ezekiel 18, you do not see sinless perfection. What you see is sinners turning from the error of their ways and God recognizing what they've done and what they are doing. That's what we see. We see the way for sinners to be pleasing to God. Very simply. And so, no, we do not hold to the Protestant view of predestination. No, we don't hold to the view of once saved, always saved. No, we don't hold to the view of once lost, always lost. We hold to the view that we can change, and the choice is ours, and God does not choose it for us. Some things God has chosen. The predestination the Scripture speaks about is that before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. The way... Right? Predestination. The destination. How man was going to come back to the Father was going to be through the Son. The way is what was predetermined. Individuals were not predetermined to be on or off of that path. The way was predetermined. Now, whether we get on that path or get off that path or anything else, that's up to us. The Lord does not make us 
and the Lord does not keep us away. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Our God is a fair God. So when we sing, just as I am, we know what we are coming as. We come to the Lord as sinners. We're convicted of our sin. We're going to talk about conviction on tonight's Zoom study. I hope you join us for that. But we come to the Lord because we're convicted of our sins. And He's the only one that offers a solution. Right? The solution is His. He gave His blood. So no, we cannot work our way independently without Jesus back to the Father. That's not how it works. By grace. By grace we say, save yourselves from this perverse generation. And by grace when we respond to that, and we save ourselves from this perverse generation, the way we save ourselves is by turning from our sins, confessing that He is the Son of God, and we're baptized, putting on Christ in baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life. And when we sin, we turn from our sins. That's simply what we do. God is fair. And that brings us all back to the Scripture reading. Back in the Scripture reading at the end of chapter 17. Did you notice what this Scripture reading is all about? This is a messianic prophecy. Ezekiel 17, verse 22, Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. The line from the tribe of Judah. I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it and it will bring forth bows and bear fruit, and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadow of its branches, they will dwell. In the New Testament, in the Lord's parables, he talks about what the kingdom is like. A kingdom is like, it's like the mustard seed. The smallest of seeds. And that it grows, and the birds come and nest in its branches. Birds of all kinds, same picture. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. What is that talking about? Oh, that's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Of every sort in the shadow of its branches they will dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree, and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. And then we get into a whole chapter that's all about repentance. So when John the Baptist and when Jesus come on the scene, what's the call? Repent. The kingdom is at hand. The invitation is yours. Do you dwell as this figure is being used? Under it will dwell birds of every sort in the shadow of its branches. Do you dwell in the shadow of the Lord? If you are not a Christian, you do not dwell in the shadow of the Lord. You may have come nigh, but you're not in the shadow. You need to come to the Lord. You need to become a Christian. And the choice is yours. If you are a Christian, but if you've been unfaithful, these folks here in Ezekiel 18, they needed to take responsibility for their own sins. And so the call was sent forth. If a wicked man turns from his sins, if he keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. The call to faith. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing today.